Well, since the dawn of the punch card and computers, you know, humans have adapted to the systems we interact with, right? It started with command line interfaces, it moved to graphical UIs, and then to touch interfaces with smartphones and tablets. But intelligent interfaces and spatial computing represent a paradigm shift in human computer interaction. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning into Notes of Design to help support our mission spread knowledge. We have a very special guest in today's episode. Let's welcome Rachel, a distinguished design executive with proven expertise driving the vision, strategy and implementation of customer experience and organizational transformation for Fortune 100 companies. Her ability to shape product cultures that humanize technology and forge meaningful connections between product and consumers has made her a sought-after operator, indispensable advisor and industry thought leader. Rachel built world-class organizations integrating human-centered design to drive product and service innovations and elevates design as strategic advantage. She brings deep expertise in design strategy, operational leadership, and organizational design, ensuring that businesses can navigate the present and shape the future. Her leadership experience spans a range of industries including e-commerce, financial services, consumer electronics, and travel. As former SVP and Global Head of Design for Expedia Group, Rachel led a cultural transformation to shift the company into an experience-led organization, responsible for design vision, experience strategy, and operational leadership for all products and services. Before joining Expedia, Rachel led prominent leadership positions as SVP and Head of Experience Design at Bank of America, Head of Studio New Product UX at Amazon's Human Center Design Group, and Senior Director of UX at Samsung Mobile Innovation Lab. Rachel serves as an advisory board member for the Design Executive Council and Executive Board Member for the Fast Company Executive Board. She also writes the influential newsletter called Defining Experiences, which provides insights on design leadership, experience-led culture, emerging technologies, and the future of work. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning into Nodes of Design. In this episode, we have a very special guest with us. Hi Rachel, welcome to Nodes of Design. Hi Tej, thanks for having me. So how was your day so far, Rachel? It's been wonderful and I really appreciate the opportunity to share my perspective with you and your listeners. And I think you've put together an awesome roster of guests and content for, you know, kudos to that. Thank you so much, Rachel. So if you could give a brief about yourself to our audience out there. Sure, I'd love to. So I'm a futurist. I always have one foot in the future and one in the present. I'm really the person that's always charting that vision for the future and helping people see the path to get there. So I focus on next generation experiences and driving experience-led innovation culture. And I'm drawn to industries that are either pioneering to define what's next or ripe for reinvention. And I leverage my expertise to ensure that businesses can navigate the present and shape the future. Uh, most recently, I was SVP and Global Head of Design at Expedia Group responsible for the design vision, variance strategy, and operational leadership for all products and services across traveler, partner, agent, developer, and employee experience. And prior to that, I was at Samsung, Amazon, and Bank of America driving product and service innovation. I advise companies, startups, and executives, and I serve as an advisory board member for the Design Executive Council. I also write the newsletter Defining Experience, and I just open applications for the Alpha Cohort of an advanced level course, Design Leadership at Scale. Thank you so much, Rachel. So what was your journey into design? How did you start and what are your tips to the beginners on starting the design journey? Yeah, so I've always wanted to be a designer since I was very little. I had this moment, I think I remember I, that I was in a museum actually, and I realized that not just the art on the wall, but everything around me, someone had designed. And it was just this moment, like I had a eureka moment where I was like, that's what I wanna do. I wanna help shape that. And so, I was heavily into art and animation as a kid, and I was classically trained in art. And I started in brand experience, actually, for interaction or UX was really a thing, and brand experience was like, you know, managing those touch points end to end. And then I got into digital product design at a startup. And when I moved into R&D at Samsung, that was when I really found my passion. Because like I mentioned, I'm a futurist, but I'm also a builder. And so I enjoy having a mix, emerging technology and building zero to one products. And I've worked, you know, across multiple industries, tech, e-commerce, financial services, consumer electronics, and travel. And uh, tips for beginners starting their journey, I would say take risks early. So explore 
different environments and industries to learn what you gravitate towards. And very importantly, your boss and your colleagues will determine your experience. So make sure they're stellar and that you can learn from them. And, you know, get experience shipping products as soon as possible so you can understand what it takes to maintain design integrity throughout the process. Thank you so much, Rachel. So let's begin our episode today into intelligent interfaces. So what are intelligent interfaces and what are some of the most important considerations when designing these intelligent interfaces? Yeah, right now everyone's talking about chat GPT and generative AI and chatbots are in a lot of those conversations, but chatbots are not the future. They are our present. And in many ways, chat interfaces are this foundation of a more conversational and natural interaction with systems and computers. But they are also the start of something much bigger. Intelligent interfaces refer to using AI and machine learning technologies in designing and developing software or hardware UIs. And the goal is to provide users with a more natural and personalized interaction. They adapt according to the individual's preferences, behaviors, context, and it enables the system to proactively predict and respond to user needs. So you can already find intelligent interfaces across technologies right now, like voice assistants like Alexa and Siri or Google Assistant, recommendation systems, um, AR and VR, et cetera. But what I'm talking about are the more advanced systems, the ones that move beyond staring at a screen and move with us, uh, the ones that are embedded in the world around us, essentially ubiquitous computing where the technology disappears. And we've been seeing these, these interfaces, these intelligent interfaces in movies for years. And now we're at a point where science fiction is starting to become a, re a reality. And so if you think about like movies like Minority Report, Her, Blade Runner, Iron Man's Jarvis, even in Westworld, the show, these are intelligent interfaces, right? So my challenge to the discussion right now is that the interface of the future is not chat. It's multimodal, it's ubiquitous. It's not a bunch of pages and pages of UI flows or detecting you know, whether or not you're on desktop or mobile. You know, Our future interfaces will be intelligent, they'll be contextual, they'll be ephemeral, and it'll be just enough interface compiled in real time based on context and relevance. And these UIs will you know, appear when they're needed and be hidden when they're not. You'll have the ability to you know, interact in the most natural way for you, you know, whether that's voice, touch, or typing, easily switching modalities based on what's natural for you, even gaze, right? It'll be fluid interfaces and you'll even have sound and haptics and it really will just enhance this calm ambient interaction that you're having with the system. Think of it more like a proactive concierge that provides what's needed based on understanding who you are and it gets better the more you interact with it. So for the first time in a long time, we'll have systems that adapt to humans instead of the other way around. Now, important considerations uh, when designing these systems, we probably would get into that a little bit later, but it's definitely gonna be privacy, data, and ethical guardrails. Thank you, Rachel. So how do you think intelligent interfaces will change the way how we interact with technology? Well, since the dawn of the punch card and computers, you know, humans have adapted to the systems we interact with, right? It started with command line interfaces, it moved to graphical UIs, and then to touch interfaces with smartphones and tablets. But intelligent interfaces and spatial computing represent a paradigm shift in human computer interaction. So unlike these like traditional UIs that require that user to learn the system's language, the intelligent interfaces aim to make the system understand the user's language. And so, like I said before, instead of humans adapting to the system, the system adapts to us and they'll be able to leverage human instincts and behaviors to create a more intuitive experience and because they integrate AI and can leverage everything from touch to voice recognition and gesture-based controls, even like in the future brain-computer interfaces, they're essentially multimodal. And so the chat interfaces we're seeing today with you know, chat GPT and others, they're really setting this foundation for multimodal systems of the future. And that back and forth interaction volley um, that we have with these systems currently, it'll lay that groundwork for how systems interact with us in the future. They'll be able to anticipate our needs, confirm our requests, and then act on our behalf. So what are some of the most important considerations when designing these intelligent interfaces for different demographics which are accessible and inclusive, and how to craft these for privacy and security when designing these? Yeah, regarding inclusive experiences, intelligent interfaces will make our interactions with technology more nat natural and effortless. So by leveraging our behaviors and instincts, they can also reduce the learning curve associated with new technologies and they can make it more accessible to a broader range of users. 
But as interfaces become more advanced and ubiquitous, it's essential to consider the ethical implications of these technologies. For example, we have to consider privacy, security, bias issues in the design and implementation of these interfaces. And we have to ensure that these technologies are designed with the user's best interests in mind and are accessible and inclusive for everyone, especially in a world where these systems can understand us on a deeply personal level. I always talk about being inclusive from the beginning and we have to widen that aperture of our thinking at the beginning of the process and look to first and second order consequences. Like when biometrics are fully integrated and systems are multimodal, in many cases embedded, these systems will understand our reactions, notice our gaze, um, they'll have predictions about our patterns and next actions. So data and privacy will need to be at the forefront when we're architecting these systems and creating those guardrails for governance. Um, and we've been, you know, as consumers, we've been accustomed to using biometrics like facial recognition and fingerprints to like authenticate and unlock our devices. Like even BMW is starting to use um, gestural interaction and gaze for hands-free interaction in cars. But this data will need to be portable and privacy will only become more and more important. Thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing those wonderful insights. So as intelligent systems became more prevalent, how do you see the role of designer and design teams transforming? I think it will evolve. Designers will become architects and orchestrators, and we'll be looking at more at the holistic end-to-end -end experiences and journeys versus just pushing pixels. You know, naturally we're dot connectors, right? But this will become even more important. And a lot of what we've learned with service design and systems thinking will come into play. So teams will evolve. Designers will need to work with a group of cross-functional partners well beyond product and engineering and marketing. You know, you know, I would say architects, city planners, ethicists, et cetera. And, you know, designers will also have to play a pivotal role in bringing those cross-functional groups together to develop these systems. So this idea that we have um, really great facilitation skills and help people to get to shared outcomes together, that's gonna become even more and more important. So Rachel, as we discussed about teams, what do you think is the future of design leadership? The future is hybrid. As the talent stack continues to collapse and teams get smaller, leveraging more technology, more leaders will be hybrids, especially leadership. We talk about T-shaped leaders, it will broaden even further. And so, you know, you've probably heard conversations, whether that's, you know, Scott Belsky or Brian Chesky talking about this collapsing and this hybrid nature. I am of the same mindset. Um, we will we will see a lot more leaders that have to have bring that hybrid skill set to the table, both both hard and, and soft skills. And so the mindset and behaviors of design will be required in the C-suite. Uh, design leaders, we really need to evolve from a, this functional mindset to a blend of business, design, product, and strategy. And we'll need this t the technical acumen to be able to architect and orchestrate these experiences. Many people are having a conversation right now about how our roles will evolve and how our jobs are going to change. And some are worried that you know their jobs are going to disappear. It's not that that's going to happen. Our jobs and our roles, and especially as leaders, will evolve, as I'm saying. And so it's going you know designers going to be even more needed in the future. Design leaders are going to be even more needed in the future. And I, you know, I actually see a very optimistic future for the future of our profession. It's just an evolution that's different from where we've been in the past. And so this idea of being able to um, iterate quickly and do large amounts of experimentation, working across tons of different services, that is going to give us a lot more leverage to be able to create the world's best or world-class products and services for customers. That, you know, and some of the stuff that we've been doing for the last five to 10 years is actually gearing us up to be able to do that. Uh, when, you know, when design systems can almost design themselves, we can work at a higher level. Thank you so much, Rachel. So what are some of the examples of successful projects or initiatives that have already moved beyond creams and adapted intelligent interfaces? Yeah, we're seeing, you know, examples in voice assistance, but um, I would take it a step further. So Humane's AI pin, uh, that was demoed at TED. That's you know that's a new system where AI, computer vision, and projection actually come together to create an assistant that's with you throughout your day and it, without using a phone, right? Where the device disappears. When I was talking about moving beyond screens, this is a great example of one of those intelligence uh, interfaces that actually is multimodal and natural interaction. So I'm really excited to see where that's going to go. And then um, Jason Wan and, Sa and Sam Wentmore. They're also working on a new computer, and that's a system that intuitively adapts to humans' intent, and it doesn't even use traditional interface conventions like folders. So those are just two examples, but I, 
you know, we're also seeing some of this happening in, um, I would say, automotive as well, where you're starting to see multimodal systems and intelligent systems that um, I think it's just going to, it's going to be, you're going to see more and more of that in the future. Thank you, Rachel. So how do you think the intelligent interfaces will change the way we live and work in the future? Yeah, think of intelligent interfaces as an extension of human capabilities. It'll streamline what used to be complicated, tedious workflows for us. So at work, it'll enable us to do more strategic work, right? Like solve higher order challenges and work faster, as I mentioned, across multiple surfaces. So this idea of iteration and experimentation will be even more rapid. And at home, it'll create major efficiencies in our day-to-day, -day, removing things like waiting on hold, uh, searching 20 websites to find what restaurant to go to. Like that will be a thing of the past. And so what will become even more important is the idea of the power of the default. Because it's changing our lives and because it's natural interaction with these systems, it'll be very important to understand what is being offered up to us as suggestions based on our preferences to be able to make decisions. Because there might have been, you know, we used to like search 40 different options. It might only offer us up three, knowing what we want to do next. So we have to be very careful also when we're designing these systems. Thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing all these wonderful insights with us. So could you please share with us, how does your day look like? Any interesting stories? Yeah, currently I'm advising companies on building design capabilities and designing the future of business, essentially. And even though we're in a turbulent economic environment, some leaders are seeing this as a leapfrog moment. And they understand the importance of making their consumer experiences their competitive advantage. And that's where I come in. So I'm also writing and developing my upcoming course, Design Leadership at Scale. Um, and on the course front, what I find extremely interesting and validating is how hungry the industry and the design community has been for this type of content. The response has been tremendous. Thank you, Rachel. So we'll conclude the episode by your three favorite book recommendations and also people who inspire you the most in this space. Yeah, so they're not my three faves overall of all time. They're my three f faves right now. Anyone that knows me knows I have a very heavy reading habit. So I'm usually reading like five books at a time. Three faves right now. Build by Tony Fidel, uh, MC24 by Bruce Mao, and A New Way to Think by Roger Martin. And then, you know, people who inspire me, uh, you know, Bridget Borgia Di Mozota for design management and management science. Uh, Tony Fidel, you know, obviously the book, but just beyond that for product development and innovation. And I'm still, in, you know, I'm still inspired by Steve Jobs, Charles and Ray Ames, and Dieter Rams. Um, you know, I, I've written about that pretty heavily. It's a part of my design ethos. Thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing all these wonderful recommendations with us. We are looking forward to host you again in our upcoming episodes. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me, Tej.